Welcome to season three, episode two of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Welcome, and we're back, and we have a great season planned and a special guest today. So thank you for joining us and for taking the first steps to grow professionally and personally. I'd like to encourage anyone who has a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The entrepreneurship program compares, prepares students in three main ways. One, we help students build businesses. It may be the traditional business, developing a tech star or a tech entrepreneurship venture or a coffee shop, pizza place, fashion wear. We also help students prepare to be entrepreneurs or innovators within a firm to develop products and services and push them to the market. And I have more than 15 students working at companies such as Apple, Google, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. And lastly, we help and encourage students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. And we have several alum who have created paths to jobs or businesses that didn't exist before. And they're making and carving their own path. And our next guest is doing just that. He's a USF alum and an alum of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. His stories always fascinate me about the trials and tribulations he's had and that individuals have as they grow in startups and the journeys they make. He's a wonderful example of how to extract value from not only university, but any type of education. He's deeply rooted in the entrepreneurial scene nationally. And our next guest is here to share his experience with us of how to be successful in the journey he's taken. So please give a big warm welcome to customer success manager at Know Before, Tim Cardi. We do this. Tim, welcome. And thank you for joining us on this Tuesday. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Sure, absolutely, Stephen. And I just want to say uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be on here. I'm I'm really thrilled for the uh, chance to speak to you know aspiring students uh, coming up in the entrepreneurship community. Um, you know, a little bit about me and kind of my journey uh, to where I am now. Uh, I got started out uh, in sales, you know, working for a private company after college. But, um, you know, my college experience, I was always entrenched in, in startups locally in the community, as well as working internships for a few of them. So I made the decision to uh, jump on with a, uh, a Series A venture funded startup out of Tampa. Um, Kite Desk. And, you know, I spent a lot of time there. Um, ultimately, that uh, startup, unfortunately, didn't see it through, uh, didn't, wasn't successful. And uh, got a job working over in Seattle for a highly funded uh, hypergrowth tech startup in outreach. And when I, uh, I finished up my time over in Seattle, I, uh, I made my way back to Florida because, you know, that was where home was. And got back into sales a little bit before transitioning back into the customer success role. So I got the uh, position at Know Before. We are a growing cybersecurity company. We're a leader in the security awareness space. And there were a there was a uh, it was a startup that was uh, growing very fast. And they recently just uh, had a successful IPO back in April. So today, my job is uh, working as a customer success manager. So ultimately, I meet with customers, I onboard them, train them on how to successfully utilize the platform and ensure that they are reaching their goals because customers who are using the, the platform successfully reach their goals. They renew their subscription, increasing that uh, annual recurring revenue, and they buy more products and also contribute to positive reviews and good word of mouth marketing. So my job today is, is just constantly trying to stay up on industry trends, uh, technology advancements within our own platform and trying to communicate that to customers at scale. Wonderful. It sounds like you've had a few different experiences in the startup scene that had different characteristics. One reason I'm highlighting this is because I want the students or the audience to be aware that regardless of where someone goes for a career or a job, 
you have the opportunity to evaluate what type of culture or situation you want to be in. Could you expand a bit about how these uh, two different startups that you worked at were different experiences and maybe if the, if the culture was different or how would you succeed in one over the other or the pros and cons to each? Got it. Well, um, you know, and overall, I, I think I've been involved in almost five or six startups, you know, including back in college, I worked in an internship for, for a tech startup, as well as um, later on, I, I worked for two, three more startups. Um, you know, something I've learned in my experience is that startups, it's almost like asking somebody what God is. You could ask 50 people and get 50 different answers. So there's a lot of uh, interpretations to it, but um, you know, certain types of startups, you know, they come with different expectations, different, um, different roles and different, uh, different futures, right? Um, the primary experiences that I've had with working with tech startups are three different distinct types. I've worked for tech startups that were small one, two person shops where the owner is just trying to do 50 things at once. And there's not a lot of time to give you, you know, a lot of direction or support, I've worked for hyper growth tech startups where there's so much venture funding and then there's so much growth and expansion. It's just trying to scale and keep up with everything. That's the big challenge. And then I've also worked for very early venture funded startups where, you know, you have expectations every month just to survive because every month you need to absolutely kill it to prove, you know, your existence and, and why you should continue to receive funding. And, you know, some things that I've learned about working in these startups, especially just before you you jump in, is really knowing the right questions to ask uh, as they pertain to the different type of startup. So, you know, the, the experiences I've had have taught me that while you love startups and while startups are a great experience, um, it's really important to know who you're getting in bed with because uh, ultimately some startups well, the majority of them, high majority of them uh, don't make it. And that was some experience that I had. Um, and then also, you know, be understanding about what you're capable of, because depending on the startup, um, it can become your entire life because you're you're at the ground level trying to build something completely on the way up. And that takes a serious amount of commitment, effort, and it can strain you in different ways. So you've talked about the culture of working in startups, and now you're working for a unicorn, a local unicorn that has gone public. And while we tend to think of entrepreneurship as starting as a, biz a business, but I mentioned you can be an entrepreneur or be innovative. I'm wondering in your role as a customer success manager, how has your skills and training in the entrepreneurship program prepared, prepared you for this job and this role and or what skills are you utilizing? You know, one of the main skills that I took away from the entrepreneurship program was uh, really through the creativity and innovation classes that we had, and especially the uh, the conferences that I would go to related to that subject. Um, you know, my job is reaching out to customers, right? Scheduling time with them. And every customer is different and our software is dynamic. So I need to figure out new ways to deliver value to them, right? With um, how without how our product works. And while I am, you know, working, like you said, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm working for somebody else, yes, but I am the CEO of my own territory. I handle my book of business. How I make my customers successful, how I interact with them, um, the trajectory that I keep them on, that's completely within my discretion. And so I'm always trying to think of new and innovative ways to you know, create workflows for them, uh, both internally and for my customers, uh, as well as um, meeting with customers and, and trying to, you know, sell them on more features and functionalities. So ultimately, with uh, being an entrepreneur, you know, my experience in entrepreneurship has taught me, like, how to have the courage to move forward with new projects, ideas, or initiatives. Um, you know, how to set forth and create things for myself. And that's a skill that you need always, right? Whether you're working for a business or you're starting your own, you know, how to think outside the box and, and how to do things to keep things interesting. <laughs> Let's unpack that a bit. You mentioned you're the CEO of your book of business. You are the 
master the universe to create the tools you need to help them and you need to cultivate the experiences or uh, know how that in order to satisfy their needs and bring them value. Is there anything that really stands out in terms of skill sets that are useful? Uh, I know having talked to you several times, there's a mm -hmm. few things that come to mind, but you know, we often in the program think that these are skill sets to build a business. But what I'm hearing is you have autonomy in your role and you're applying these skill sets. And I'm wondering, are things that rise to the top in terms of must haves compared to nice to haves or, you know, however you want to view them? Well, I would definitely say a, a background in sales definitely helped me out a lot when it came to um, to reaching out with customers because, you know, it's there's a lot of similarities, right? Um, I'm reaching out to people without a schedule uh, or unscheduled. I'm trying to pitch them on value, get them to meet with them. Um, you know, I have to manage follow-up. And again, I have to manage a, a, a successful cadence with up to 300 different customers, right? So staying on top of that, uh, managing that, that's definitely something that, you know, a sales background helped me immensely when I made the transition back to customer success. Um, and, you know, when, when it comes to really what, what makes you... Uh, what can make you valuable to this in terms of a skill set? Uh, I would just say, if you could Google, you know, ten things, ten talent, uh, ten activities that require zero talent. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's stuff like you know, being on time, following up, um, communicating, taking feedback. Um, all of those are are very important in customer success because you know you are while managing your own territory. Your boss, is, I have three hundred bosses I answer to. Um, on a regular regular basis, right? Um, their success is my my job, and um, you know, again, I mean, being a, being from a sales background definitely helped. Having a certain aptitude towards technology, knowing how to present with confidence, uh, those are two. Those are a few of the skills attributes that I would highly recommend that students get involved in. Yeah. We talk about pitching. How much of video are you using in terms of both follow up, communication, education, ge lead generation? And where does the role of video play? Is it growing or how can we utilize our skills? Because in my classes, we use a lot of video. Is that a main uh, tool for you um, mm -hmm. in your processes? Absolutely. Um, video, especially. Um, I meet with uh, the majority of my customers either on Zoom or Google Hangouts. And um, ultimately, I always uh, I leave my camera on at all times because I like to put a face with uh, the product that they're they're interacting with. And um, you know, I would uh, I would also say it uh, it creates a stickiness right with the product because people don't associate no before with a screen that says TC on it, right? They see my face, they say me. Uh, I create an experience for them. You know, while I'm professional, I know how to keep it light. I know how to inject humor at certain points. Um, just to overall make it a great experience for the for the customer. So video, you know, is the way of the future. It's going to be the way that a lot of people communicate moving forward, and it's going to be a mission critical application for many. So I would definitely advise anybody to get on board with video and become proficient at utilizing this. I know you have a wonderful story about cold calling, and it it's both uh, humanistic. Uh, it's almost tragic, but also a hero's journey at the end. Would you would you be willing to share that with us? Because I think we can learn from it. Sure. Um, so this was actually my first internship uh, out of college. This was at a local. Uh, it was a local tech startup at the time called Health Hero. Now I heard that the owner was going to be speaking at the uh, One Million Cups. So I missed that. I watched the presentation on replay. I reached out to. Uh, uh, Ruben Pressman is another entrepreneur in the in the community and asked for an introduction to this guy. And uh, this is a this is a guy who belonged on the West Coast because he just has that kind of energy and enthusiasm that uh, it's tough to find around here. But um, I remember one time, you know, when I was working on my internships, uh, he would kind of reach out to me with these assignments and just say, "Go with it," you know. And this was one of those occasions. Uh, he was working on an initiative for the uh, city of St. Petersburg. And he just reached out to me and says, Tim, I need you to cold call 15 businesses and I need you to get on board with them. And I, I remember just 
I was terrified. I never, I never cold called before, but I told him, I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. And part of that is stepping outside of your comfort zone. So I guess this is exactly what I signed up for. So I, uh, I called maybe uh, four or five businesses to start and just word vomited everywhere, <laughs> you know, just, uh, maybe a little too giddy or excited or, or whatever. I probably, you know, threw up everywhere, but, um, he called me back. He said, how's it going? I was like, I don't, I don't know about this, you know? And he goes, look, it's really simple. You know, you just call, you just be cool, suave. Think James Bond. Can you be James Bond over the phone? And I said, sure, sure. I can. Could I get a script please? And he, uh, he gave me a script and I just, uh, I remember I failed through six or seven more of them before I, I finally got that one win. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that was a big, big step for me because uh, it taught me something about entrepreneurship is, you know, when you create a business, you know, it could stay on a business plan or you can pick up a phone and you can call somebody who's never heard of you before and you can pitch them and you can sell them on your idea. And, you know, for any entrepreneur, that's, you know, that's just a bridge you're going to have to cross at some point. I'm going to do a shameless plug. In this same line, we're having our own pitch competition on November 13th. What words of wisdom would you share? The students can come. They have an idea. There's a low barrier to entry. They can win money. There's unlimited pizza. Is this something they should uh, participate in and or any wisdom or encouragement, Tim? Um, oh, wow. Absolutely. I mean, pitch competitions. Uh, I did that. I went to the CEO conference in Kansas City um, and did a pitch competition there. And I remember the number one thing that they advise is do not memorize your pitch, like word for word verbatim. Uh, they had a, a YouTube video. I don't remember. They uh, shared it with us all that showed this one one character who tried memorizing her speech. And maybe halfway through, he just had an epic meltdown. Um, so yeah, when it comes to pitching, yeah, so uh, gosh, it's been so long, but um, ultimately open with enthusiasm and confidence is is going to be what sells most people on your business, confidence in what you're doing. Thank you. I know you're a big uh, advocate for very practical tools. What can students do right now to help build their profile, their their stats like an athlete? And since you know the local ecosystem, what can they uh, add to their toolkit or where do you see the, you know, this type of um, skill building mm -hmm. uh, going forward? Right. Well, I mean, I've got quite a few recommendations um, in terms of it. I would uh, I would get involved right in as many student clubs and organizations and activities as you can for one. Um, try to ingrain yourself in the ecosystem. Get out there, right? Um, you know, I feel a lot of students will go to class and then they'll get a grade and go home, and they're they're depriving themselves a lot of the uh, the experiences and the real value add from being in college. So, you know, what I did was I, I used to go to conferences all the time. I stayed in touch with all of my professors, who a few of them, including yourself, had some great opportunities for me. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that I always recommend and I think has is, is helped me immensely is my experience in Toastmasters. And if, uh, if nobody here is experienced with that, uh, Toastmasters is a it's a international organization for improving your public speaking skills. But uh, what I found, especially through going there, is it improves your listening skills, your communication uh, and, you know, your writing overall and all their all are very, very important and you know when when setting up your own business. And ultimately if you're looking for, you know, a job as well, you know, how to how to do these skills and having these skills is is gonna really be what sets you apart from most other applicants. I'd like to ping the audience to start thinking about Q and A questions for Tim. This is a perfect time to get granular, a perfect time to be able to connect with someone who uh, has left a trail of breadcrumbs for us to follow, who has able to create that path so we don't have to fight that jungle out there, that uh, chaos, and, and has given us some insight. So please think of some questions that you might have for Tim. Tim, I would say in the entrepreneurship program, probably 70% have students have a side hustle. I'm seeing 
anywhere from 25 to 45 percent of the students have side hustles if they're not majoring in it. What's your side hustle? Yeah, so um, I actually was a uh, competitive boxer for about six or seven years. Um, I still train. It's been well over a decade. Wow, I, I am old. Um, so I've been in that sport for a while. And one of the passions that I always have had was just working, exercising with people. Uh, my favorite thing is is taking people who really hate the gym. You know, they don't want to pick up heavy weights or they don't find any joy or excitement in that. And, you know, exercising them out with uh, boxing drills and exercises, uh, training them kind of like a fighter. And at the end of the workout, they'll say, this is so much better than lifting weights. <laughs> um, so ultimately, I, uh, I work with a couple of people doing boxing lessons and tutorials and such like that. And the uh, end all goal for me is I, I'd like to open up my own boxing for fitness gym. Um, you know, currently where I'm at right now, I, I really do enjoy my role and I enjoy technology. And I think it's dynamic and it's growing. But at some point in my time, I, I do see myself making that transition. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, and this doesn't apply absolutely, but they say that the best times to really start your own business are kind of when you're young and you have very little to lose or when you're on the tail end of your career and you already have an impressive track record to fall back on. So I guess I'm kind of uh, leaning towards the latter on that end. <laughs> Boxing, great. It reminds me of the time when in high school we decided to create a uh, fight club and that did not end well for a lot of people but uh boxing excellent because i heard that uh, there is a correlation between those who sweat and the, their success compared to those who watch other people who sweat so wonderful i'm happy to hear boxing still i grew up uh, following boxing in, 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 in my neighborhood i'd like to open the floor for questions who's chad yes so, oh, I wanted to ask, once you're through the startup phase and your business is established, do you have a, a spe specific things you focus on once your business is up and running? Um, well, from a, a technology standpoint, right, um, ultimately you'll get customers and you need to establish basically how to get them onboarded, which is the quickest route that they can take to prove a justifiable ROI on your product. Because once that's done, you know, you can continue to grow them as a customer, introduce new features and functionalities. Um, so I would say ultimately uh, customer success, really, you need to have certain health metrics, certain indicators to establish what a healthy customer is, right? Are they submitting a lot of support tickets? Um, you know, what's their feedback on the product? Are they utilizing certain features and functionalities? Um, and then ultimately, you know, you need to have a plan because success is the, the journey. You need to have a plan about really knowing when the right time is to introduce these features and functionalities for their success. Because ultimately, you don't want to overwhelm the customer and, and just show them everything at once. You want to gradually bring them along and you want to do so over a regular cadence because you want to continually reach out with value. So really... When you get a customer, understand, you know, what they're doing, how they've been successful and, and see how you can replicate that at scale, you know, because ultimately you want all your customers to achieve that kind of success. So really just make sure that you talk to your customers and, you know, find out what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, so you can make better decisions with the rest of them moving forward. Okay, thank you. Chad, to piggyback off of that, you mentioned and asked about the scalability class. And what Tim is talking about is this idea of organizational learning or even in his role to continuously learn. And one view and one paradigm of scaling or scalability is this idea of organizational learning. And this is exactly what Tim mentioned. It's how you learn from the client on what they're doing well or what they're not or what your product is not doing for them. And you can go back and ferry it to the innovators or research and development or develop team to improve that, to meet their needs and sell them and really, you know, make this product market fit in order to meet their needs. Wonderful. Yeah. And to, to highlight on that, you know, I'll meet with a lot of customers for stuff like new features or just getting into a beta program. And every time I meet with them, it's the same thing. I say, hey, while you got me, I want to hear your feedback. You know, how's things working for you? Any problems, anything I need to be made of aware of, please let me know. And, you know, sometimes I have to pivot, right? Uh, features functionality call could total turn into a big support call. I need to answer for why certain training content is available or why this function isn't appropriate uh, for them or utilized, right? Um, 
you know, those those things happen all the time. Thank you. Lauren, you had your hand up next and then Momo do. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, when you were talking about pitching, you said don't memorize your pitch word for word. I wanted to ask what kind of advice you have for someone pitching an idea or pitching a project. Um, is it more like think about your bullet points and talk about the most important things? What kind of advice would you give for that? Hmm. Well, uh, I'd say that you can always practice a pitch to perfection, but it's very, very hard to actually be, give the perfect pitch, right? You can only do the best you can. Um, in terms of it, I would, you know, I would definitely utilize, yeah, bullet points is a great tool, especially when uh, presenting, because I feel like once you practice it a few times, you know the general, you know the delivery, right? And you know how to communicate it. And ultimately, um, when you when you have a general idea, it sounds more authentic as opposed to when you're kind of reading or memorizing word for word as well. So it comes off as more natural, and I think that uh, the audience will be a lot more receptive to something like that. Awesome, thank you. And Lauren, you you might know this better than anyone coming from animation. The role of story, regardless if it's pitching your idea or your the story of your you know, animation, the role of story is invaluable. And that also happens in business, entrepreneurship, innovation, right? The, the trials and tribulations of Steve Jobs or why we need 10,000 songs in our pocket or et cetera. You get the idea. There's always stories that are tied to um, whatever idea. And, and that is a wonderful way to help you, but also help the audience understand what you're trying to, to get by. Thank you. One more do. Hello, my question is more of um, how you picked what startup to go work for. Because I'm in the process where I have to like pick the internships, but on face value, uh, they kind of all look the same to me. So are you picking based of where I can grow more or where I fit in more? Where I can grow more or where I can fit in more. Um, well, I would say in terms of growth, if you're working in a tech startup, that's that's ubiquitous, right? They're they're pretty much everywhere amongst startups. Um, you'll always be asked to step outside of your comfort zone in a startup. That's simply the nature of the game. So you will always um, always grow at a startup, and then um, to where you'll fit in. Gosh, it's a hard thing to say. I mean, really. You know, there, I would I would recommend uh, utilizing Glassdoor if possible. But um, my my take was I would always go on LinkedIn, which is an incredible tool for professional networking, and I would reach out to sales reps and you know any kind of associates I could find on LinkedIn, and I would ask them personally, say, hey, can I can I borrow ten minutes of your time? Like I would love to hear your take on this company. I'm I'm in the process for interviewing right now. Um, you know, get firsthand experience because you know I'm sure a recruiter or the founder will tell you, you know, what they think you want to hear, but, um, you know, it's always best to kind of get an interview from the people who are actually on the, on the soldiers on the front lines, you know. To expand on that, you have to also be reflective on what you're looking for. Are you looking to fit in or are you looking to grow? Are you looking to do X, Y, and Z and maybe that one company after you follow Tim's advice is going to meet that while the other one is not going to meet that right now. But you have to take an inventory of where are you right now and do this extra step to contact the people or sales reps or whoever at those companies so you can have a better idea and filter to know where would be a better fit for your career. It's not just about fitting in. It's not like a social environment. It's not only a social environment. But it's also a career trajectory, and you have to figure out what is going to build that next, uh, give you that next piece in that building block of your career. And then also, you know, really understanding, the, asking the hard questions, getting the numbers right from startups, because I, I had the experience with myself um, working at a local startup. I love this company to death. It was it was the first company I ever fell mm -hmm. in love with. And, uh, you know, we had uh, a CEO or who was a great guy. He emailed us on Sunday night and said, come in for an early breakfast meeting. And then the next thing we know, we all were out of work and drinking. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, I would say another thing with, with getting into startups is uh, don't be afraid to ask the, uh, the hard questions, like how much funding do you have? You know, what's your one way like? Um, you know, what are the investors' expectations? Are we meeting those goals? Like, how on pace are we with uh, reaching those? Um, what uh, what new products are you launching? Like, and maybe even test the product yourself because uh, you know, tech tech is a tough uh, is a tough game um, if you have a, a product that's new and uh, buggy at times. <laughs> so these this advice is relevant to cor working for corporations and not startups. You want to know what you're getting into, regardless of what role or job. And that might be, is it a new division, a new team? Uh, how, you know, what experience does that manager have leading this whatever initiative or vice versa? If you're working and moving toward, um, I don't know, a, a non for profit, do they actually have funding to be sustainable? Or are they generating enough fundraising to to grow or are you just constantly turning the wheels and trying to collect money to put keep lights on etc che i see your hand please share hi good morning i didn't get a chance to say good morning um so i have two quick questions for you one would be um is there any specific reason why you chose working for a startup over like a really established company one and two um is there anything like in your journey that you feel like you could have done differently yeah, so those are great questions. Um, so what uh, what got me into startups? I mean, I would say I always I always just kind of loved startups, right? In college, I loved that you know you had a, a stake in something, a stake in ownership, in helping to create something new and innovative and try to bring it to the next steps. And um, ultimately, what I really wanted to do with startups and why I wanted to get involved with them was just you wear multiple hats, right? You are always growing. You're always learning. It's it's dynamic. And I never wanted to be at a corporate company where I felt like I could go in nine to five on autopilot and just check a box for the most part. Um, I wanted something where I would always be growing and I always always be learning. And in startups, that's, uh, that's never in short supply at all. Um, and if you ask me... Um, yeah, what I what I think I, I could have done differently. Um, um, it's tough to say. Um, I would um, I would say maybe, you know, with uh, moving over to Seattle, I think um, I was overwhelmed. Right. Um, I think uh, I think I should have made that decision. Right. Um, and I could have turned it down because ultimately it was a great opportunity for me. But I did not know myself well enough to know at the time that it was the wrong time for me in my career to be taking a jump like that. I had been at Kite Desk for just over about seven or eight months. And I went to a mid market position that I really wasn't ready for. And I, I definitely did pretty well. But it was a it was a massive struggle and it was kind of overwhelming and I ultimately came back here in Florida. But um, really just know how to take a proper inventory of what you're capable of and fully understand the role, right, that you're jumping into and say, be honest with yourself. You say, Am I ready for this kind of jump? Am I ready for this type of position? Or do I need more time to focus on my craft or perfect my skills in my particular profession first? I liked how you framed it when you went out to Seattle. I want to go off script or improvise a little bit here. There's a lot of talk locally about, you know, of course, we've we've heard ARC investments coming and they're putting their name on an innovation center. We talk about how great the ecosystem is here in St. Pete and, and can tell by the tall buildings growing. But let's 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 try to pull some things apart. How is the ecosystem here in Tampa Bay? different than what you experienced out west is there a different and is there pros and cons or what does the local ecosystem um, need to reflect upon and take inventory of well that's uh okay so i mean ultimately i think tampa bay is is definitely growing i've seen a lot of um, new things and a lot of changes come out of this area in a very short time so i, I think we're doing fairly well 
um, ultimately what I, I really experienced when I move over to Seattle for a little bit, um, it's just a lifestyle, uh, startups, ecosystem, all of that, um, you know, grinding, going all out and really trying to push something, you know, I go for a cup of coffee and I could flip a quarter in any direction and hit a startup. It was, it was just like that. Um, very common in, in Seattle. Um, they, they have a type, very different type of mentality. They're very uh, aggressive in how they do business over on that side, because I think that there is ultimately more um, VC funding and more, more opportunities like that. So there's a lot of growth and there's high expectations for the money that they're receiving. Right. So um, it's a lot more nose to the grindstone, a lot more of that. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a different feel right from uh from what what's going on i i remember you know getting an uber ride from the airport there and my uber driver was telling me he's like well i'm a developer too i'm starting a developer and it seemed like everybody i was talking to is is just trying to get into the tech tech industry over there it's just what what's to be doing you know um you know so ultimately i think tampa has come a long way but um you know there's there's certainly uh more more that uh you would expect before we could kind of make it over to the west coast west <laughs> coast It's interesting that you shared that um, because it sounds like there is one picture of what's going on. Uh, then there's a ground level and your response had me thinking if we're promoting innovation and entrepreneurship, how does that influence the local culture to a certain extent? You know, we have beaches, we can say salt life and sun and fun and all these other things is there a different type of entrepreneur opposed to generalizing oh we want all entrepreneurs or all innovators moving here and maybe there's a nuance to, for us to carve out our own niche that isn't this aggressive way of doing business that has some of the characteristics about doing out west but are primarily focused with the nuances of whatever tampa bay region is or the subcultures here and I'm wondering if there's a, a way to mash that up that could be beneficial, but without crowding out the the roots of the culture or some of the nuance of, of the local community. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, my experience has been primarily in technology, but from what I've seen, just going to 1 million cups and, and getting an understanding of what entrepreneurs are doing and how they're carving their own niches. That's what's great about um, entrepreneurship. You know, you can really find your own way and find your own niche. And it's, it's fairly easy to, uh, to complete that kind of endeavor. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, Florida, I mean, you know, one of our highlights, right, is, uh, is, is tourism and uh, beaches and, you know, Floridians who grew up here, you know, they're experts. They're experts in, in their own culture and their own and their environment, stuff like that. And they they know how to they can they can know how to make a business out of that. Really, it's um it's within it's within their power and it's something that they can do if they want to pursue it for sure. In fact, I would argue we have a long history of that. We haven't had that many big companies here and the jobs weren't here. So what was in the water or the air? They were creating their own businesses, getting by doing their own thing, but very different than just tech entrepreneurship, a lot of services, a lot of tourism, a lot of hospitality, but can also be very rewarding and connected to the land and, and, the, and the culture here. Wonderful. Uh, we have uh, some time left. I, again, I would like to prime any of the audience who may have questions. We haven't talked about this and, I, and we talk about taking inventory and reflection. What is not said about entrepreneurship that needs to be said? Hmm. <laughs> or is everything talked already? Everyone knows everything. And what's, um, what's, what's the dark part? Oh, the dark part. Sure. Um, the dark part is. Hmm, I would really, I guess I, I touched on it before, you know, when I worked for my first tech startup at, uh, at Kite Desk, you know, we, the stress that comes along with it, you know, we scratched and clawed for any and every deal that we could. And, you know, we were constantly just kind of living and, and just trying to see to it that we, uh, we were there tomorrow, you know, and 
ultimately, I, I think that what's not said enough about it is you need to know how to respond to failure because that's going to happen for any entrepreneur at some point in, in some capacity, right? Um, knowing how to take that failure, how to pivot, how to grow from it, how to rise from the ashes, uh, you know, failure will always give you two options. You can stay down or you can get up, right? And so most important really is not said enough about it is, you know, you're going to experience failure. You need to embrace it as a learning experience and you need to know how to move on from it. Does the audience have any questions? This That was a great comment. How can we think about learning from failure? Well, we have a pitch competition. We can apply, we can win, and, we'll, and or we can learn. So you talk about learning from failure. How do you keep learning? How do you stay relevant, Tim? Well, me, I, uh, I follow the cybersecurity blogs right in our industry. Our CEO, uh, an incredible guy, he spits out something like four blog posts a day. I don't know how he does it, but uh, keeping keeping in tune and check with that, um, constantly studying the product. Uh, our product, especially you know, before is is very robust and dynamic. So it's always figuring out new ways to customize the product to my customers. And ultimately, I, I am always going back to the drawing board to find a new and effective way of you know delivering that product to to my customer or customizing it for them. Um, so I mean, Change and innovation, that's that's a big part of my my day to day every day um, is just trying to figure out new ways to, again, work with customers to make them successful. I'd like to open the floor for questions. And more importantly, Tim has emphasized the role of extracting value from education or the network around us. We have Jeffrey on the call who whose department does that for our students. Jeffrey, would you be willing to share how students could partner with you to extract value in their education? Sure, Steve, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, so for the students out there, I um, am the assistant director in the undergraduate programs office in the K. Tiedemann School of Business and Finance. Now that title really doesn't mean anything except for the fact that we do get involved in a lot of career related activities. So as you start to think about what you want to do and how you want to go about it, uh, we are a resource. We've got a number of individuals in our office that can help you figure out what you want to do, how you want to do it, internships. We can help you job search, internship search. Uh, we can connect you with certain individuals. I won't say I've only been in the area for about 15 months now. So I don't have the extensive Rolodex that I would like to have locally, but uh, I'm working on that. But there are others in the office that have been here a while. So I'm happy to help any student at any time. Thank you. I have one last question for Tim. And I ask all my guests. Maybe Chase stole my thunder a bit, but we'll see if we can reframe that. If you could go back to your younger self, Tim, what advice would you give him? Um, <laughs> what would I give myself as advice? That's a tough one. Um, ultimately, I would uh, I would say one of the things I, I didn't uh, really cons really understand or grasp is is to really just approach every a job or position you have as a learning experience. Um, really see what you can take away from the company. I, that sounds horrible, but um, you know what kind of value you can take from them and how you can apply it to other jobs and roles moving forward. And even looking back on it, uh, you know I've had horrible horrible job at well companies before, but um, you know, I look, I take what I take from that. I say, okay, now I know what kind of red flags to be on the lookout for in the future. Right. Um, stuff like that. Uh, when my, my kite desk or failed, you know, like what, what were the questions I should have asked or what should have, what were the warning flags I should have been aware of? Right. Um, every, every failure that you have, you know, can teach you something and um, just really embrace embrace what you can learn from a company and take that as as the value that you get not necessarily just a paycheck because especially when you're starting out the uh the paycheck will you know 
pay your bills, but it might not uh, give you the lavish lifestyle you want right out the gate. Um, so don't look for, you know, paychecks as the ultimate end all for what you get out of a company. I would tell myself, you know, look to see what you learn from this company and, you know, make sure that you apply it to your next position because, you know, it, especially your first couple of jobs are not going to have to be your career, right? They can be stepping stones to something greater. Thank you for those words of wisdom, Tim. For those who want to connect with Tim, Tim, how do you suggest the students or audience reach out to you or stay connected? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you guys want to connect with me via LinkedIn, that's probably the best way. I'm always on that. Um, uh, my, you can search for my name, uh, Tim Carty, C-A-R-T-Y. I'm at no before. Um, you know, I, I always enjoy pointing people in the right direction. I've been in the, the tech ecosystem for a long time. So if uh, you're a young and aspiring student, and you want to learn, you know, what you can do to kind of make an impact or get involved in something. Um, I know of a lot of friends in the area who are always looking for help and they're always looking for uh, people who want to learn something about business. So uh, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, you know, any other kind of special arrangements, you can feel free to email me, uh, timcardy24 at gmail. I'm usually on my personal email quite a bit. Tim, thank you for spending the hour with us, sharing your wisdom and reconnecting with the, the students of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. I would like to give one last plug. If you do want to network, Tim will be at our pitch event coming up in November. Those flyers have and will be continued to be sent out. Please expand or can consider submitting and uh, learning in the process. Yep. Let's give Tim a big round of applause. Uh, we know that we do that. Yes, exactly. Tim, <laughs> I'll be following up uh, shortly and we'll, we'll reconnect. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Stephen. It was a pleasure being here.